Hi, I'm Dave Kittrich, filmmaker in Los Angeles, and this is The Outcast, presented by Outfest, where we have conversations with LGBT creators and allies to discuss their work, their inspirations, their passions, and the challenges of getting our authentic voices heard. And today I have three incredible people who have made an indelible imprint on New York theater as well as film and television. We have Tony Award-winning director Michael Mayer, Tony Award-winning actor Christian Borle, and Tony Award nominee, and I think a lot of other awards as well. But... <laughs> <laughs> we deal in facts here, you it's know? It's great. No, oh my god, it's great. <laughs> well, you say Tony Award winner, Michael Mayer, Tony Award winner, Christian Borrell, and Tony Award loser, Jonathan Groff. <laughs> you know what? Two-time two, Tony two Award time, loser. But, but... <laughs> I got to see your butt on Broadway in 2006. And what a butt that is. It was a lovely butt. Jonathan Groff, <laughs> who everybody knows, and honestly, my friends are extremely jealous that I'm talking to you. Uh, I want to say the date. The date today is June 4th, 2020. And the reason that I'm saying this is because a lot of the things that we're going to talk about is stuff that is happening right now. It's a very pivotal moment in, uh, in American history and uh, certainly in the history of the theater, not to you know be reductive. Uh, but being that you guys are all incredible veterans of the New York theater and the West End, like, can you tell me, you know, what do you think is the future here for New York theater? I think that that remains to be seen. There's a lot going on right now in terms of imagining a future for it because it doesn't exist for the first time. In my experience, in my life, there is no theater. In any of ours, really. It doesn't exist. So the future is to be determined. Yeah. I keep coming back to, you know, so much has happened in the last three months. We'll see where we are in three months from now. And then in three months from then, and we'll see. For me, it's about looking at what data has changed. Because it can't just be about time progressing. Like, what will have happened in three months that would make people come back together in a group and feel safe. Right. And right now we have no idea what that will be. And until we do, we, um, we wait. It's also tough for Broadway because anybody who's been to a Broadway theater knows, I mean, it's not exactly social distancing, you know, friendly. I mean, there's, there's really no way to get people in those theaters, in those seats, and, and have it be conventionally safe from something like COVID. No, you really can't do it. And, and you don't want to. Yeah. Because theater is about communion. It's about a group of people coming together in one room, breathing together, receiving a story together, laughing together, weeping together, whatever. And when you're doing it right, it's really about fluids. <laughs> <laughs> and we can't. Jonathan, do you want to take over? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh my we can't God. be afraid of fluids moving forward. I can't stress this enough. <laughs> well, Jonathan's, I think Jonathan's career in the theater may be over at this oh, point. No, given no. How, just how fluid he is. <laughs> He's a famous spitter. I know. It, I feel like it could go one of two ways. I could either, it, people either be scared of me or I'll be passing out the antibody to the first three rows. Oh, that's a nice way of thinking about it. <laughs> Sharing. You're a, you're, you like to share, Jonathan. You're very I generous. I do. I do like to share. Spread it fluids. around. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things I did want to talk to you, because you guys are all, you know, you, you came out of the theater, but but your careers have all branched in all sorts of media. I mean, Michael, you know, you've done opera, you've done uh, feature films, you've done a TV show, which I absolutely want to get to because I was an early, early fan of Smash along with a lot of people I know, um, and Christian, you know, and Jonathan, of course, my, my favorite show right now is Mindhunter. Nice. When you guys do different kind of media, like what attracts you to one media over the other? Is it kind of like the, the interest of the project itself? Or is it like, oh, I kind of want to do this now? Cash. Cash works. <laughs> no, Michael, you were formulating a real answer. I, my real answer was just that whatever, I, I think it's project by project. For me, anyway, I don't think like, oh, well, I've done two Broadway shows in a row now, so now it's time to do a TV show or mm, feeling a hankering for opera. It just doesn't work that way in my experience. Different, you know, opportunities present themselves and, and we all uh, have to make choices. And so it's always in the moment. What is the, what is the thing I want to do? With opera, for instance, that is planned many, many years in advance because of the scheduling of the singers. So I will know five years out that I have dates 
for an opera and I'll schedule stuff around that. But otherwise, it's what comes up, you know? It tends to be a pretty pragmatic um, decision-making process. I'm still in that place, and I think a lot of actors are, of like, when I get a job, I'm still kind of like, really? Fantastic, I'll, I'll take it. Because, you know, we're all plagued by self-doubt and a little bit, you know, to a degree. It's about the people that you want to work with, and that's why I love this trio. You know, you have a finite amount of time in your life and you want to spend those moments with people that you know you're going to have a positive, invigorating, creative experience with. And so uh, it's mostly about the people. And then sometimes I did a job for money, and it was the cliche experience of like, well, I made that money, but it was no fun at all. Which one? Are, can, <laughs> can you tell? I, I'm thinking it. Will that suffice? <laughs> Did it, did it happen to have a Hemsworth in it? Because I actually like that movie. No, no. That, are you kidding me? That's what the only... I've only done two movies. I got cut <laughs> out of both of them mostly. But no, no. I was thrilled. That was... I'm a huge Michael Mann fan. Just, I couldn't just believe for, my life. Just for the audience, because I'm a huge Michael Mann fan, um, Christian was in a movie uh, called Black Hat, which got dumped on by most critics, except then it made a bunch of top ten lists, which it should, and, and it has a director's cut that is on FX, which completely reorganizes the narrative. Literally, is it told through the perspective of Roby Show? No, no. Oh, but, but well, you then do, I don't want to say. <laughs> you, you do get talked down to by like Viola Davis and, and, and uh, Hemsworth, so it's just like, Great. you know... My work here is done. <laughs> anyway, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk to you, uh, going back to Michael, you know, by the time you had done Spring Awakening, which was Jonathan's big break on, on, on Broadway, mm -hmm. you'd already been really well established. I mean, you had directed uh, You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, which I think brought to the, the mainstream Kristen Chenoweth, if I'm correct, Thoroughly Modern Millie, which of course Christian was in, which was lovely. And I saw years ago on Broadway, I still remember that 11 o'clock number it was amazing. And you went on to direct American Idiot and the revival of Head and the angry inch you know so there's new stuff there's revivals there's all sorts of stuff what about a project really brings you into it like what is it that hooks you uh usually it's the story and in some when it's a musical i would say it's the music and the story and if i have an, an idea of who i might be able to to tell that story with who the collaborators would be if it's an idea that is at the very beginning and i can actually help pull like who the writers are as well as the, the all the designers and and especially the actors then that's great but sometimes it's already formed and i come on with a, a piece that exists already and then i just get to think like ooh, maybe i could have christian borrell in this or jonathan or both <laughs> like little like little shop <laughs> Is this the first time that the three of you had worked together? Yes. As a unit, yeah. It went swimmingly. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of laughter and a lot of really good ideas that gelled. And not, if I'm not mistaken, not a lot of overthinking, I think. True. Our instincts kind of gelled very well. Yeah, it was a, it was a very, very happy uh, group of collaborators. But the first time you and Christian met, Michael, was on Millie, correct? Millie. That's correct. And that was a magical run. That went for a very long time. Right. Yeah, it was a healthy run. And I, to be clear, I replaced on that. I replaced the magical Gavin Creel on that. But then you were, Christian, you were in a ton of stuff. I mean, you've just been working basically nonstop since, like, you know, Millie, you know, from everything from uh, Legally Blonde. I, I have a list. Legally Blonde, Splam a lot. Uh, on the Town, Mary Poppins, you were in Angels in America, and then you were nominated for Falsettos, which is on Broadway HD and is absolutely fantastic. So, so lovely. Thanks. I'm really proud of that recording of that beautiful show. They did such a bang-up job with it. They really you know, did. Sometimes theater on TV can be tough, but, you know, I grew up loving... It's how I fell in love with Sweeney Todd. It's how I fell in love with Into the Woods, was, you know, just mm -hmm. wearing out those VHS tapes. Sunday in the Park is great, too, with, mm -hmm. with Mandy Patinkin Ooh. and Burnett mm -hmm. Peters and Pippin. So sometimes when you can capture um, a live event like that... Um, it's really special, so I'm so proud of the job that they did recording it. And then, Michael, you directed the pilot for Smash, which Christian was a, one of the leads. That's right. And that, from everything I've read, was a roller coaster. Basically, coming out of it, was it a good experience for everybody? Absolutely. I, I loved it. I would say that making that pilot was one of the great thrills of my life. 
it was a it was a roller coaster. It was so intense, but I loved it so much. Do you remember the the thrilling moment of the roller coaster ride when I was doing my hair and makeup tests? And you walked up to me and changed my hair, and that became the indelible Tom Levitt look. Yes, I did. <laughs> I'd had my hair this kind of back. This is a real theme these days, <laughs> me, and, me and, and touching hair on actors. Do you want to continue? Talk about talk more about that. That's why we're all here. Oh, uh, <laughs> is, this, is this the life of a director? It's like, you know, it's all it about the hair. It can be the life of the director. You know, it's, you know what, what gets on screen is, you know, it's the director's responsibility and sometimes that includes hairstyles but the, but it was a big 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 you know priority for the network that year i mean i know that rob greenblatt who was the head of nbc and it was produ ex exec produced by steven spielberg it was like a huge deal that particular show um the, the, and there must have been enormous pressure to get that pilot exactly right did you have to go back and reshoot stuff we did we shot the pilot as written and then, and, and I loved it, by the way. I thought it was really fun and really soapy and juicy and very sexy. And then um, some stuff got changed. They wanted, to, they wanted to sort of postpone some of, in particular, I would say, a lot of your stuff, Christian. They wanted to like put off some of your se sexcapades, your characters, mm -hmm. sexual stuff. So, and That's there was some- That's my favorite part. I know, but you should have seen that original pilot. He slept I, with two guys in I one did, pilot. Didn't I? Yeah, and I did. appeared in a terry cloth robe at one point, I believe. You, you did. Whoa. You, you did. <laughs> I remember the note being at some point wanting to make me more me and uh, Deborah more relatable. And so Teresa yeah. wrote a scene where we eat macaroni and cheese. She was like, "What's more relatable than macaroni and cheese?" <laughs> that's, that's exactly um, right. Give the people what they want. Question yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so they cut they cut out all the gay sex and they added macaroni and cheese. Is what you're telling me? Well, no, that what they added honestly they added more of karen and dev and they added that whole uh story with her parents oh okay so that it was like more karen less gay sex <laughs> no. Boring. When we do the reboot, yeah, know exactly. we know where to prioritize. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Less Karen's parents, more gay sex. <laughs> right. Smash two. <laughs> the reshoots were basically that was the main gist of those reshoots. The thrust, if you will. Spring Awakening, you cannot overstate the impact that that had when that opened on Broadway. Real quick, how did that entire show come about because you know we're living in this era of like ip you know it's like if it doesn't have a movie tied to it or some kind of identifiable thing spring awakening was an obscure german text right i mean and not exactly something that a lot of you know big money producers would jump at immediately i would say that if you ask you know any any theater director in the world they'll all say they love spring awakening the play by vedekind it's a it's a a favorite of directors because it's the sort of the birth of expressionism and directors love expressionism because it often lets them off the hook of having to <laughs> deliver any genuine like, human <laughs> journey because it can all be you know jangly and weird um, and they can do their thing they can put their thumbprint on it but the the show is never meant to go to Broadway the idea was not to do a Broadway musical based on Spring Awakening the idea was to tell that story with music and new lyrics because Steven Sater who it was his idea the writer um, it was right after the Columbine shootings. Oh, wow. He wanted very much to make a piece of theater that would address the concerns that we all had about what are we going to do but about our kids? How are we going to protect them? And isn't there, there's a, a terrible, horrible history of negligence that was a perfect, uh, terrible example of what happens if you're not talking to your kids, if you don't really hear them and see them and help them become responsible adults, you know, through the challenging teenage years. And Stephen hit on this play, which is exactly what it's about. It's, it's kind of a um, cautionary tale about what happens if you, if you ignore your kids, leave them alone and don't explain shit to them and help them. So the idea being that the rock and roll of it 
is kind of the um, essence of what is inside a young person. What are they? What are they wailing into their into their hairbrush in their bedroom as they're jumping up and down on their bed when they have no other outlet to express themselves? So that's really how how it happened, and it was really meant to be an off Broadway art project. It was not meant to be commercial, and it's only because it kind of took off and and got so much attention, and became a thing that it ended up going to Broadway. Because in those days, an off-Broadway musical was not financially feasible. Even after Rent, which is kind of mind-blowing, because Rent, I thought, rewrote the book, but you know, it's obvious that that mindset was still around. Yeah, Rent was a different story. Though. I mean, Rent was really about adults. Yeah. Young adults, but they were, they were independent, and so it wasn't about uh, the responsibility adults have for right. the young people in their charge, whether they be clergy or in school or parents or whatever. Well, Spring Awakening is a much more grown-up kind of tale. I mean, you know, the way that it's told and, and, and you know, kind of approached. It's, it's you know, Ren is, is great, and I remember seeing it when I was, I think, you know, 20 or whatever, getting the little $15 tickets at the, at the front of the theater. But, you know, Spring Awakening has a very, very different vibe, and it, and it leaves you in a very, very different place. In Rent, you're ready to, like, dance down the street. In Spring Awakening, you're just like, you know, you're left with this beautiful heaviness because, of, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a happy ending. I mean, from well, for you, Jonathan, it's not a happy ending. For a couple of the, the gay characters, it's actually a happy ending, which is kind of amazing. Um, but, Jonathan, why don't you tell us about how you came aboard? I came aboard, I moved to uh, New York right after high school because I wanted to be in musicals. And I, in my first year in New York, while I was waiting tables, I went to the audition for Spring Awakening because I was obsessed with the musical Thoroughly Modern Millie that <laughs> Michael and Christian were both in. And Michael, uh, you know, I had seen the show six times and I knew Michael and I knew the song, I am barely breathing. I can't find the air, which was the Duncan Sheik pop song. It was song. played all the yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was just trying to get to Michael Mayer uh, at that Spring Awakening audition. The material I, I like and the music was way more heavy and cool than I felt that I was personally. I was just trying to connect with Michael. So then, <laughs> and then I auditioned for Spring Awakening. <laughs> And then this, like Michael said, we were all just anticipating that it was going to be an off-Broadway experience. The show took off. But even in when we moved to Broadway, we couldn't sell half the house throughout previews. And even it, it really took the Tony Awards to, to throw the show into, into commercial success. It was the nominations. The nominations. It was those nominations. Yeah. Suddenly we were selling out. Yeah. Well, and the, and the performance. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. that helped us, but we weren't, we really, we were at, running at a giant deficit for months, actually, <laughs> until the end we were just hanging on for the Tony nominations. And yeah. we got something like 11 nominations or something, like a crazy number. Yeah. And the next day, suddenly we were making money for the first time. Everybody so wanted to the see first it. Time I yeah. mean, it was word of mouth. This was, this was a word of mouth hit, this, this show. Yeah. I'd heard about it, and I knew of its existence, but I didn't know it was a thing until those Tony nominations came out, and everyone was like, whoa, what is this? Because it was an enormous number of, of uh, nominations, a lot of love from the Tony uh, nominee uh, voters. I don't know how that works. I yeah. guess it's just Tony members. The yeah, there are like 270 of them or something like that. Who nom? Uh, oh, oh no, the nominators. Yeah, it's I don't remember. It's even I don't even know. How, I know how it works for the Oscars. I don't know how it works for the Tonys. It's similar but different, probably. I don't <laughs> really know actually. <laughs> I have no clue. So you don't know? <laughs> I really don't. Know. <laughs> so Jonathan, you were in yet another Broadway landmark. And again, there's no way to overstate the impact that Hamilton has had, not only on Broadway but the culture. I know I'm skipping ahead a bunch of stuff and a bunch of credits and a bunch of years, but, you know, thematically, I feel like it's, it's, you know, it's the next question. How did you come about Hamilton? Well, I feel like the only thing I want to say more about Spring Awakening before I talk about Hamilton, just since this is the Outfest panel, is that I was 
having sex eight times a week on stage with Leah Michelle, and I also at the same time was in the closet throughout the entire experience. And it was such a profound experience because on stage that show is about sexual expression and there's a song called Touch Me in the show and it's there's so much pent up energy that I was experiencing in my real life and that when I look back on that experience as a as a gay person I feel so grateful for the form of expression that that show allowed me to have that I know also kids in high school will have. <laughs> well, you were only 20. I get emotional I mean, just talking about it. You were, you were only 20 or 21, right? I mean, you were, you were basically a kid yourself. I was, yeah. And like you said, there's not a lot of musicals, there's not a lot of theater that take kids seriously. And that show is, is one of those shows. And I feel, I felt so uh, taken care of also by that cast and by Michael in particular. I'm sorry, I'm getting so emotional. Uh, <laughs> and then ultimately when I left that show, so I was in the closet the whole time that I was in that show and I was playing this character of Melchior who was this like rebellious, spoke his mind, didn't care what other people thought. And I was the total kind of opposite people pleasing person. And that was also part of why I was in the closet because I was always afraid of offending anyone or, or making waves. More, more like and, the looking main character of all people. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And then when I left the show, because of the opportunity to play that part, I had felt like I had cultivated this side of my personality that didn't exist before. And I came out of the closet about a month after I left Spring Awakening. Wow. And I credit that having had that experience and I, and, and Michael for, for giving me the kind of courage to do that at 20, I was 23. This was a decision you made. This was a considered decision. Yeah, totally. Were, were you dating someone at the time or was this just more of a statement? I was, I was in a closeted relationship for all of spring awakening. We were together for three and a half years. Aww. Yeah. We all have those early 20s relationships that are just I know. They're bittersweet and lovely. I, but... I feel like I'm still having those early 20s relationships as a 35-year-old <laughs> sometimes. Anyway, I just had to say that because it's Outfest. But now we can talk about Hamilton. Uh, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, given the times uh, and given what's going on right now, uh, Hamilton may be seen in kind of a different light um, and a little more resonant than even when it was when it came out. I remember after the 2016 election going to see Hamilton in Chicago out of town, and even then it had a different resonance. I feel like that, that show is obviously so political even in that moment, the, the feeling in the audience was different with the current administration than it was with the previous administration. And certainly all of the current events only add fuel to that fire and energy. I wish people had the ability to see and perform Hamilton right now. I think it would be really therapeutic. You know, all four of us, we're, you know, I believe, I think we're Caucasian. I mean, we certainly don't know what it's like to be a person of color, but it's undeniable what's going on out there. Like, you know, has this affected the way that you guys look at what you want to do next or what's coming up? I think it can't, you can't help but think about the shows that were out there in the future, possibly, and think about how to engage with that work in what is going to be essentially a new world um, in some way, shape, or form. Hopefully very new come November. Yeah, God, God, God help us, yes. But because nothing's real at the moment, you know, it's, it's all, it's theoretical. I've been, th I've been thinking more, I guess, about what I have done than what I will do since it's all kind of... I have a few projects that are likely to happen at some point, and I can think about that a little bit, but it's more about, um, it's a time of reflection on how did we get where we are? How did I get where I am personally in my life and as an artist and the, the work that I've done? And, and 
So, you know, it's one of the very few um, pluses of this pandemic is that it's afforded us all a lot of time to, to think about stuff that we haven't necessarily had the, the luxury to think about. Yeah, I think it's just, it's a time to shut up and is how I'm feeling about it. I mean, even as the, the pandemic was happening, I fell more into the camp of like, well, this is an opportunity for us all to take a break and take a breath mm-hmm. and read a book and maybe um, ease up on the content production, you know? Um, I don't need someone's performance of a song in their living room to lift my spirits. I've got other ways of doing it. And now um, as things shift um, in a totally different direction, I mean, I'm looking at the four of us, everyone's numb and everyone's um, very, very sad and hurt. Yeah. And I don't believe in social media. I think social media is wh- why we are where we are in terms of Donald Trump being president and why there's so much noise, which is obscuring the voices that we need to hear. And right now, I think it's uh, my responsibility as um, an old white straight man after this lengthy diatribe to shut up so that we can hear other people. And so I would urge people to go and watch Amber Ruffin from Seth Meyers for the last three nights, her experience with the police, her just everyday experience, three nights in a row, she's had three different stories to tell where her life could have ended just because she was black and watch Killer Mike's speech um, in Atlanta. Those are the things that I'm listening to. That and the sound of my own voice right now. So I'll <laughs> I'm, I'm still hung up on the word old because they think two of us are older than you, Christian. I was just going to say, if you're old, I'm really in trouble. <laughs> it's all I relative. Think I'm, a, I'm a year older because I did my research and I have your dates of birth. And it's like, you know, they're... they're... Well, I'm rounding 50 for Pete's sake. I mean, that doesn't feel young. Yeah, well, okay. I'm rounding it before you. And it's like, you know... I'm rounding I'm, 60. I'm, listen, I don't, I don't think old is bad, but I do think that, you know, I'm, I was talking to an 18-year-old last night. Um, uh, one of my friend's sons who I've known since he was five years old, suddenly he's 18 and he's talking about the change that we need. And it's going to happen when this generation of old white men like Mitch McConnell, is finally gone, you know, not to be too like mean about it, but it's a fact that a lot of these old white men will be gone in 10, 20, 30 years. And that will help in a way. Well, I mean, it it's also to. no, absolutely, and I think it's a lot of it is because of what society was when those guys came up in the world when they were in their twenties and the thirties. It was a very different time. It was a time of extreme expansion. It was a time of a very robust middle class, and it was a time uh, where government could do stuff like build interstates and <laughs> and the Civil Rights Act and all this other stuff. Um, you know, I, I think that the the belief that they have that that population of people, uh, and not all of them, of course, um, about what it is to be in a society, what it is that society owes you, is very much out of whack with the reality of, of, of the last twenty years. You know, and I think that that's reflected in their politics. I think it's it's not necessarily that they're bad people; it's that they don't really they grew up in a certain way, believing certain things which were true at that time. But are no longer true. That was the blip. We're not in the blip now. We're in something else. And we need a different set of like beliefs about what government is and, and what we owe society and others and in our government, like healthcare being a right. And, um, you know, we need to be able to have a more progressive tax structure because, you know, we need government buoyed. We can't just load it up all in the middle class. We can't destroy the middle class. Agree to disagree. Oh. I'm just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that all makes sense, except I do think a lot of them are really, really terrible people. Oh, actually. I mean, yeah, I there, really there, there are a lot of terrible people. If you're given an opportunity, for example, to repudiate somebody saying, grab them by the pussy. And if that moment, if you don't take that moment in time to look at who you are, where you are, what you can do, yeah. and you go the other way, I think yeah. that demonstrably makes you a bad person. That's Switzerland. Then you're Switzerland. And if you're, if you're neutral and the Nazis are on one side, mm. then you might as well be a Nazi. You know? Do you want to know more about Outfest? Of course you do. You're listening to this podcast. 
Outfest is the only LGBTQIA arts, media, and entertainment nonprofit organization in the world whose programs empower artists, communities, and filmmakers alike to transform the world through their stories while also supporting the entire life cycle of their career from outset to legacy. And what that means is it is one of the largest LGBT film festivals in the world and one of the largest film festivals in North America. Also, Outfest has a tremendous number of programs for young filmmakers as well as archivists preserving gay stories for all time. It is a truly outstanding organization. And especially right now, we would love your help. Please go to outfest.org and learn how you can become a member of this fantastic organization. The cliche goes, theater and film, I mean, we do change minds, we do change hearts sometimes. I mean, you know, people's eyes have been opened by theater and great works of theater. Hamilton, I think, is one of the things, how we got on the subject. Uh, I think that opened a great many people's eyes and hearts and minds. Um, you know, in, in a similar way, Looking uh, was one of those series that really kind of changed things. Um, we had seen gay series before, but none quite like Looking. Um, Jonathan, could you talk about how Looking came about? Looking was a pilot in development by Michael Lannon at HBO. And then in 2013, uh, Andrew Haig came on board. He's a filmmaker who did a movie called Weekend that I was a big fan of. That's a, one of my favorite gay movies. Uh, he got attached. We made a pilot and we did shot two seasons in a movie. Uh, and the show is try, try to be just a slice of life of, of a group of gay guys living in modern day San Francisco. Uh, real and raw. <laughs> Uh, sex, sex, <laughs> sex, the, the, the sex was a big, and now we're, now I'm reminded that it's an Outfest podcast and the importance, <laughs> the importance of the gay sex, uh, to this podcast. Uh, happy to bring that. Uh, well, it was cut out of smash. We got to put it in somewhere. <laughs> we did, a, we, I shot so many sex scenes on looking and they were, they were some of my favorite stuff to do. We all were sharing our stories together on set that, that, you know, there was, it was a sort of rare uh, environment where it was mostly gay people on the set and everyone was throwing in their two cents and laughing a lot and crying a lot and talking about breakups and talking about relationships. And uh, it was incredibly, if Spring Awakening allowed me to have the courage to declare who I was. Looking was then an experience for me that by being forced to, to talk about gay identity and be forced to put on an anal cover and have somebody pretend to eat my ass out or whatever it was, uh, it, was a, it was a really out of body and uh, uncomfortable experience in all of the most kind of fulfilling ways. I think I have to ask on behalf of everyone, can you please explain the anal cover part of this? Like, yeah. what is, it's like just a piece of saran wrap. I mean, like, like we I had, I think we invented it. I've I been think... on a lot of sets and I've literally never heard of this, but I mean, I've heard of like the, the, the crotch pocket, like, you know, when you're doing nude scenes and you have a little sock over your junk, but yes, but I was also wearing that. And, and Raul Castillo, who played Richie, um, on the show, he was going to have to be, you know, my legs were in the air and he was going to be, he was going to be sucking my dick and then eating me out and then sucking my dick. And so we hadn't, I, so I was going to be in the dick sock, but when I was like getting ready that morning, I, I felt bad that he was going to have to put his face like so close to my anus <laughs> without anything covering it because I wasn't wearing underwear. I was just wearing the dick sock. And so I asked the costume designer Danny what to do and so it was kind of like a little band-aid just like a little and we just like put it right over my butthole traditionally we use a fruit roll-up but you went with the band-aid that's interesting I, my, <laughs> um, Michael this reminds me by the way I, 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 I pitched the show to Jack Davenport called Cock Sock Talk with Jack Davenport. <laughs> it was just him sitting by a roaring fire in a smoking jacket talking about, and he would have guests 
on to talk about their cocksock experiences. <laughs> mm, that is such a good that. idea. It may be, maybe maybe for Disney Plus now that that's up and running. <laughs> yes, <laughs> this, this podcast is going to get canceled and replaced with this. I think within minutes of this going live. So I assume that you know going to Frozen and Frozen Two after that story is probably not the best. Just leap, right? It's I'm leaping into looking... the unknown, really. <laughs> into the <Yeah>. unknown. <laughs> Best song of the year. I listen to it like once a day. <laughs> Panic at the Disco. No disrespect oh to Dina. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Continue. I was recording Frozen while I was doing Looking, so that was happening simultaneously, so it feels very tied together to me. And then also, adorably, the entire cast and crew of Little Shop of Horrors came on opening weekend, and we all went and saw Frozen 2 together. They it was so adorable. Support. We all got tickets. It was, so it was sweet. in between shows. We were all sitting there. And Jonathan, who tends to lend his time to people who need his time most, is, can be late, but not because he is inconsiderate. <laughs> it's because he's generous. So we're all sitting there. Wow. The previews are, are all ended. I'm saving a seat for Jonathan. And it's like about to start and here's the lone figure with his backpack and his bike helmet just kind of like coming up the aisle and all these sweet young kids having no idea who's walking up it's the Christoph. aisle to... <laughs> it's adorable amazing i'll never forget watching that movie with you christian it was really fun when and I the whole so cast excited. everybody went it was so sweet it was beautiful you're so, loved my friend and at the end of at the end of into the unknown when all those particles are in the air christian leaned over to me and he said Finally, frozen fractals all around. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you said? Yes. <laughs> yes. Give the, the people what they want. Say yes, again. frozen fractals. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I did want to ask you, Christian, mm -hmm. you did a bunch of sex scenes that were gay, but you're not gay. Jonathan, mm -hmm. you've done a lot of straight sex scenes in Mindhunter. In fact, it's bewildering in season one how many straight sex scenes you had. You had a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, you want to you wanna talk for a second? Sure. Oh, I remember feeling really... Um, part of the reason I didn't want to come out of the closet during Spring Awakening is because I had to have this sex... This, the whole climax of the show was a sex scene between Melchior and Vendla. And I remember not wanting to, feeling, feeling personally self-conscious about never having been with a woman in any way, shape, or form. And now I'm performing this sex scene on stage. And that, that was part of the reason why I didn't feel I want, I, like I could get away with it. If, 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 if I was gay, suddenly that scene would seem less believable. Um, and so I stayed in the closet. And then when I did looking and I had my most intimate sex scenes with Raul Castillo, I learned so much from him because I learned that, first of all, it's it, it, when you're playing a sex scene, it's all, it's obviously all, unless you're doing a porn, it's all pretend and it's, it is a, it is a performance, but there is a level of intimacy involved. And Raul, uh, a straight guy who's never had a gay experience, came to that came to those sex scenes with so much love and so much uh, uh, honesty and real questions and just threw himself into it. And it created this really magical experience between the two of us and I think also a magical experience on screen. And so then when I got to do another straight sex scene after that, uh, I did one in mine, a couple in Mindhunter, I really thought of him and I thought this, I don't have to be self-conscious because in certain things I don't know what I'm doing. I just have to be honest and be myself and try to find chemistry with the other person. That's what I learned. It's not about your sexual orientation because I've also done sex scenes with gay guys where I don't think it's been successful and I feel that we've had horrible chemistry. And then there's some sex scenes where I've watched where it's two straight people and they have no chemistry. So there it's mm -hmm. the, regardless of that they're that they're both, you know, the same sexual orientation. So I think that in any like in any in any of our personal sexual experiences, we've had good sex and bad sex. And it sort of is the same way on screen. It's about trying to have a real exchange with someone and trying to find real chemistry with someone outside of whatever you identify as. My, um, I had a sex scene with Neil Bledsoe, an actor in season one of Smash, 
And I approached it from just wanting to show the audience what, how it defined Tom Levitt, the character I was playing. What do we learn about Tom Levitt through sex with this guy? And I talked to Billy Porter for a great long time. I just had like specific questions about what, if you just have the shot, the visual of it was post-coital, what could we learn about their dynamic physically by their position, what drawer was open? And I remember having the discussion with, about what the network would allow as well. The network would not allow a drawer by the bedside to be open for some reason. Because for me, the implication was like, that's where you keep X, Y, Z. Or could we have a wrapper? Or, and there were things that we could not show. Wow. That I just wanted to kind of like tell a detailed story. I would just say we ended up with Neil in the crook of my arm with me stroking his ear. And to Billy, that told a very specific story mm. about what our physical dynamic had just been. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you had to take the lube off the drawer to not, to not show the lube to NBC. Yep. You know, wow. you can't show anyone in ha- you know, with smoke in their mouth. They can have a cigarette and hold it. But you can't show anyone inhaling or exhaling. Huh. Whoa, that is fascinating. I think that basically the, the answer to this question that you is like that's the beauty of acting is that we all you know it's make believe, and I think it would be a shame if anyone, any actors are not you know allowed to play certain roles just by virtue of who they actually are as, you know, as differentiated from the character. That's why we want to be actors. We want to play people who are different than we are. And Mm -hmm. so uh, I I think the gay for gay and the straight for straight thing is maybe not in the best interest of creativity. There's all sorts of pressure in the world to protect yourself from being vulnerable, from being authentic, you know, and and all sorts of distractions. Michael, I'll start with you. Like, how do you keep your work grounded in in a real authenticity? Oh, I I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the wrong I don't question. Think of it that way. I don't. I just guess I'm hopeful that my that I'm an authentic person and that what I do will reflect what I what my beliefs are I just I hope that's true I don't I don't think about it so much maybe I should (laughs) (laughs) you're doing just fine Michael don't overthink it (laughs) I hide behind a veneer of (laughs) self-deprecation to lower expectations around how my work is perceived and I think I allow people to think that I'm a clown and an overactor when at the end of the day I go home and think very seriously about specifically what choices I'm making and what I want to communicate and so I think I allow people to underestimate my uh, authenticity. I've heard many stand-up comedians actually say almost identical to what you just said, that they, their, their veneer of what they say and what they do and kind of being, you know, telling jokes or being self-deprecating is actually, it's almost like hanging a lantern on what's most important but kind of daring people to like mock them about it. I'm fascinated by stand-up comics for that very reason. Would you ever do it? No, I don't think I have that skill set. I would love to see you do a stand-up set, Christian. I think it would be really, really angry. There's a long history of stand-up comics being angry, though. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I I mean, I think I have things to say, but I don't think I have a way to say them in a funny way. So that I think technically is not stand-up comedy. I think it's just standing up (laughs) and yelling. (laughs) 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 But I have a feeling I'd get canceled pretty fast. (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, Hannah Gatsby seemed to get away with mm-hmm. it. I mean, that was incredible. Very powerful. That was an amazing thing. Yep. What about you, Jonathan? I think I think I my my biggest thing is to not be in cruise control creatively. Consciously trying to change it up and not do the same thing over and over again. And when I take a, an arrow out of my quill and shoot it, 
take a different one out the next time and try, even if it doesn't feel like it's going to be as successful if the first one was, just trying to constantly grow, I think is my answer. Michael, I wanted to ask you about your film work, uh, because I would be loath to not mention A Home at the End of the World, which you know, almost every gay man I know has seen. I mean, it was on Logo uh, over and over again. It has one of the most adorable, kind of heartbreaking gay performances of that era by Dallas Roberts. Um, Mm. And, you know, an adorable 2004 Colin Farrell, who's simultaneously somehow boyish and yet masculine at the same time. It's it, It was like alchemy, that movie. How did that movie come about? And and was that your first feature? Yeah, it was my first movie. Wow. My first anything. That came about um, when Tom Hulse called me up out of the blue to have dinner with me. I didn't really know him. And we sat down and he said, I've seen a lot of your stage work and I have the rights to uh, Michael Cunningham's book, A Home at the End of the World. And I love the book. I'm a big Michael Cunningham fan, and he said, how would you like to make a movie of it? I really was like, um, sure. <laughs> it was really out, completely wow. out of the blue. Um, and so we started putting it together, and I just jumped in with him and, and just trusted him with, with all of it. Um, and we teamed up with um, Christine... Vashon at Killer Films and John Hart and Jeff Sharp at Hart Sharp Films. And they've done so much great um, and important um, indie filmmaking, like really wonderful stuff. So I felt like I was in really great hands with these producers. And then Michael Cunningham wrote a really beautiful script of uh, adapting his own book. And we sent it out to people and People wanted to be in it, and I was auditioning, like, real actors, you know? And I send it to, like, Sissy Spacek, and she's like, I want to be in this movie, so... uh, She is so fantastic in that film. She's amazing in that. And Robin Wright Penn, and, you know, and for, you know, Dallas ended up being... um, He's someone I knew from when he was at Juilliard, so he was a pal of mine, and... He came in and gave an absolutely beautiful audition. And at that point, um, Colin had signed on. Um, He was very hot at the moment, and this was a real departure for him. Uh, And Colin read with everyone, and he and Dallas just really connected. And everyone said, sure, do it, even though he's completely unknown. It's a beautiful film, and the ending especially is, is really lovely and touching and unexpected. Um, Was there a lot of, I mean, not to, I I don't want to give anything away because you should see it, um, but was there any discussion over, over that ending? Because it's, it's a very unconventional ending. I mean, you know, basically it's a very kind of linear one to two to three movie. And then in the last couple of scenes, there's, you're left with a certain feeling of ambiguity. I think that's, that's in the book. It's, it's slightly different in the book because Michael combined the character of Jonathan and Jonathan's lover into just Jonathan. So it really remained a triangle through the whole thing as opposed to it becoming two different triangles or a a series of three triangles that that are in the book. So in so doing, he created this Dallas kind of was playing sort of both roles and then Colin's character, Bobby, ends up fulfilling the role of the lover at the same time. So it is it is ambiguous and deliberately so. It's lovely. And I and I actually think I've seen that house in Toronto. I was on a I was on a show a few years ago and I think we shot in that house. It's in a little town outside of Toronto um, called Mississauga. I love that house. And I bought a house many years later up in the Hudson Valley that is very similar to that. So every now and then, when my husband and I go in, you know, he'll quote some lines from that movie as uh, we, sometimes when we approach it. <laughs> Jonathan's been up there too. I love it. Anyway, that was a, it was a really incredible experience. And it was really amazingly challenging because it was my first movie and I had that, you know, Colin's character, there were three kids who, you know, three actors playing that one role. 
two different actors playing Dallas's part. It, it was over three decades. It took place in Cleveland and New York City and Arizona and in four different seasons. And we had a very small budget and we shot the whole thing with the exception of two days, um, one in Arizona and one in New York City for exteriors where we had, to, you know, we made up the whole thing. Uh, it was crazy. That's amazing. We needed snow. We got snow when we didn't want snow. We, we didn't have snow when we needed snow. It was that kind of insanity. But I loved making it. And, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I look at it every now and then bits of it. I can't watch the whole thing of anything I've ever done. Again, once it's over, I kind of, want to, I don't want to actually watch it, but occasionally little things will pop up and I'll remember um, with great uh, affection uh, making those scenes happen. I want to ask you about The Seagull, which came out a couple of years ago uh, with Annette mm -hmm. Benning. You know, that is an iconic work. How did you approach doing that? Well, you know, this is another Tom Hulse joint, right? So <laughs> we were talking about The Seagull and how much we both loved it. And he was talking about a version that he had seen at the Guthrie where it starts backwards. Where the, the, whoever, I can't remember who the director was. I think it was um, maybe Andre Serban one, or um, Liv Chule, one of the great Eastern European directors, had this concept of starting the story in the fourth act. And then when Nina shows up, it all rewinds and you, you go back to the beginning. And it seemed to me like a really terrific cinematic idea. And we went to Stephen Karam, who's a beautiful playwright and who has a kind of Chekhovian spirit about him and pitched him this concept and he he really took a shine to it and jumped in. And we told him Annette Benning was very interested in playing this role that she had done. You can't do any better than Annette Benning. Oh, no. I mean, she's, it's, it's one of my favorite performances of her. Uh, and I've seen everything she's done. She's, she just, this is a role she did when she was in drama school, when she was 20. Oh my, and she oh dreamed God. of getting a shot at it again wow. when she was the right age for it. So she'd sort of been storing up over the decades, ready to, to do this. We had 21 days to shoot an unbelievable cast who, uh, to a person, was just there because they loved the material and really wanted to jump in and play with us. It was Fast and furious. Michael, Christian Borrell here. Um, <laughs> just staying on the checkoff tip, you did a production yeah. of Uncle Vanya with the late, great Roger Rees years ago. I did. And it, the show started, the house opened, and he was sitting on stage reading a newspaper while the audience filed in before the play proper began. In Little Shop of Horrors, uh, running off Broadway, you have a spoiler alert, an actor on stage as the house opens, hiding under some garbage. Can you talk <laughs> about your... <laughs> Um, proclivity for having actors miss out on the half hour experience backstage and it, how important is it to your storytelling that that happens it's a motif Christian that's what uh -huh. we call it uh -huh. and it's you know I try to do that in every seven shows that I do understood <laughs> so yeah I will keep track of that remember yeah, when you asked me you were like here's an idea how do you yes. think what do you think about yeah. lying here when that and I was like it's an interesting idea. Wow. It's really for, te for someone else. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe Teddy could do that. I believe there's another derelict or wino in the script. Am I? <laughs> Sorry, that Teddy. Totally... Oh. I didn't know you were asked first, Christian. I did ask, I ask Christian first for everything, always. Yes. I give him every opportunity. <laughs> you know, I asked him to play the Annette Benning role in The Seagull, and he just said, yeah. you know, I think Annette... Might be, she's been you know, waiting since she's yeah, 20. She's been, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you might have to shave for that, though. That would be a... Never! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did want to ask you, because all three of you have had, you know, amazing careers. Like, are there any particular projects that have a special, special, special place in your heart? I, I think fondly on a great number of things that I've done. I mostly think about the people that I've worked with. I mostly think about acting choices that I'm stealing from people that I've worked with and admire and putting my own spin on it. And oftentimes in my, uh, you know, extended 
time on this earth, I think about how far I've come and how much I've learned thanks to those people. And uh, it's mostly in that capacity, but I, I think that most, the three of us would say that we are pretty present in the thing that we're doing um, and are not looking to repeat triumphs of the past, just happy that there have been any at all. Correct. That's, that's exactly right. So can uh, any of you talk about what's coming up next? I mean, I know this is kind of a weird time and nobody really knows what's coming up next, but is there anything that anybody can like look for? Well, I'm really, I'm personally looking forward to Little Shop of Horrors coming back to the West Side Theater sometime. I was going to say, is the there a date yet? Few or? Months. No, no, no. Okay. But um, I miss it. I'm not ready for that show to be over yet. Same here. I just want to get back to it. Well, the last thing I want to ask, and this is the last question I ask, you know, every single podcast is like, aside from the advice saying, just do it, what advice would you give up and coming actors or directors or filmmakers or artists? Um, I would tell them to see everything they can, to go and see everything um, that is available to them and to see it in a number of different ways too, you know what I mean? Not just to see plays and not just to see films, but to take advantage of, of the dance and, and movement and um, museums, whatever is like all that stuff to just soak in everything that, that could possibly be um, inspirational. I would say be brave enough to get off social media and do not fall for the lie that your getting cast is dependent upon how many followers you have. Mm. It's baloney. Obviously, they want you to have followers because it helps them with marketing, but that's the job of the marketing department. Get off social media. It's the end of the world as we know it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> oh, preach. Jonathan, do you have any advice? Oh, my God. Uh, I didn't go to college. I never formally trained as an actor. I studied voice along the way, sort of pick up things from people. But I, I just, I guess I'm just, I would echo Michael. Anything that I've, the sort of like, you know, speaking from my own experience of wanting to be an actor and then becoming one, it had everything to do with watching everything I could, asking as many questions, taking advantage of every opportunity. It just following the thing that, that makes you excited. Because some people think they want to be actors and then they, they sort of muscle through it even when they've lost the joy mm. and they create a lot of problems and a lot of misery inside of a company. Uh, so I would say making sure that you constantly check in with that joy meter and, and that you're still passionate about the things that you're throwing yourself into. I think that's a lovely place to end this. I really appreciate it. Michael Mayer, Christian Borland, Jonathan Groff, thank you so much for being on. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And this has been The Outcast, presented by Outfest. For more, go to outfest.org slash The Outcast. The Outcast is executive produced by Ismail El-Sharif and Alan Konigsberg. Special thanks to Damien Navarro and the entire Outfest team. Music by West One Music Group. For more information about Outfest, the film festival, the programs, and all the ways that you can help support LGBT voices, go to outfest.org. The Outcast is a production of Milton Ventures Media and Triple Fire Productions. I'm David Kittredge. Thank you so much for listening, and catch you next time. <laughs>